Hey everyone, if you can start to settle in over to our seats. Thanks so much all for registering and being here tonight on this school night. It's really great to have you all and to support this amazing student-led and I want to emphasize student-led programming, many of which are in the room here um, that goes with COP27. Um, I would love to introduce John Furlow, who's the director of the IRI and has probably been to more cops than, than anyone <laughs> that I've been alive, maybe perhaps. Um, we've got a lovely talk for you tonight and I'll let John take it from here. Hello everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm John Furlow, as Lindsay said. I'm the director of the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. That is our building, we're out at the Lamont campus and we specialize in mostly seasonal forecasting. So looking forward a few months into the future. Um, and we work almost exclusively in the developing world. We find that those seasonal forecasts are really helpful for uh, really important economic activities in the developing world like agriculture, tourism, and then things that support ongoing economic activity like uh, dealing with vector-borne diseases like malaria and dengue and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we not, only we're not just comprised of uh, climate scientists, we have people, agronomists, health workers, and others who help connect the science to decision making in the developing world. Um, that is not exclusively what I'm going to talk to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about the COP. Uh, as Lindsay said, I think this is going to be my 15th. I worked for the um, US Agency for International Development for a long time, and I was part of the US delegations for I think about 10 years. And then I've been to the last few, uh, I've been here for five years and I think I've been to three or four with Columbia. And then there was one year that we didn't have one because of COVID. Um, so thank you for coming. Before we get started, I, wanna, I want you to think about uh, flying on an airplane. If you're lucky, you get to ride in first class. If you're pretty lucky, you get to ride in business class. And if you're like me, you end up stuck in the back and coach. So I want you to think about that as a, and, and the challenge that I'm gonna throw at you now. Imagine a flight with about 197 people, 96 people on it. Um, there's only two in first class and they have a ton of stuff. They've got books, they've got pets, they've got televisions and computers and stuff and their luggage. Um, and there's about 24 people in business class and They've also got a lot of stuff, not as much as the two in, in first. And then everybody else is back in the back. Um, and the, the two people in first class, between them, they have 4,000 pounds worth of luggage. The 24 in business class have about 4,000 pounds worth of luggage. And then everybody else in the back, between them, they have 2,000 pounds worth of stuff. So a little over 10 pounds per person. And the pilot comes on and says, hey, the plane is overweight. We cannot take off like this. And we've got to take about three or 4,000 pounds of luggage off. And I'm not going to decide how to do it. You have to work it out amongst yourselves. Everybody has to agree. And I'm not taking off until you agree. So um, how about if you two, Kevin and Sarah, you're in first. Lucky you. Um, this side will represent the business class folks and this side minus Kevin and Sarah, you're representing the back of the plane. Um, what are you going to do? How are you going to come to an agreement to get rid of almost half the stuff on the plane? What kind of leverage do you have? Especially if you're in the back, you don't have anything. You've got your toothbrush, maybe you've got a book um, and a change of clothes. What are you gonna offer to Kevin and Sarah, the folks on this side of the room to get them, because the plane is not gonna be light enough. You guys could give up everything you've got and the plane still can't take off. So what do you have to work with? How do you use your leverage? The plane won't go until you agree. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay, 
Anybody in coach? Does that sound? How does that sound? If it's only one person, then we're going to get rid of 11 pounds. And we're trying to get that's, you know, about 1 30th of what we need. Oh, it's an aisle seat. <laughs> and maybe it's big enough for two or three of them to squeeze in. All right. So this is the challenge of the negotiations. Um, and we'll come back to it. But uh, getting 190 plus countries to agree on something that appeals to everyone is the challenge. And there's really, there's only a few countries that really have to make the sacrifices, but everyone is kind of being expected to. So before we get going, just, I don't know uh, what schools you guys are from or what your background in climate is, but just to make sure that we're on the same page terminologically, if that's a word, um, weather is what's happening right now. It's hot, it's cold, it's humid, whatever. Climate, is kind of, you know, some people say it's the weather averaged over time. Kevin could probably give us a much more thorough definition, but um, it's what you think about when you think about a place. Miami is hot and humid. Phoenix is hot and dry. Um, New York is kind of in between. Climate variability is what can happen year to year that's within the bounds of sort of what you would expect in a place. It's a dry year, it's a wet year. It's not crazy, completely different. But it's, it's, it's what you experience when one year is different than the next or one season is different. And then climate change is what we're really talking about, which is where we're putting, we're changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere and it's changing the way the climate system works. Uh, and so we're getting, it's getting warmer over time. And then these other things are sort of layered on top of that underlying change. Um, so what, how did we get here? Humans are clever. Uh, with engineering, we learned how to turn long dead plants and dinosaurs and stuff into fuel and turn that into energy for transportation or heating or lighting and whatever. Um, burning all that stuff has changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere. So we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have other gases that have changed too. Um, and that leads to warming. It's a physical change, which is leading to biological changes. Plants and animals don't like living in the changing environment. Um, and then that's leading to social and economic change. And the question that we're talking about at the COP is, can we get some political change to kind of work our way back through that chain um, and get things a little bit more normal? So how do we know it's changing? Uh, there was a guy named Ralph Keeling who wondered whether the composition of the atmosphere was changing and he put a monitor on top of Mauna Loa um, in 1958, I believe. And he's been, he and Noah have been tracking this ever since. And so uh, in the late 50s, there were below 320 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And now we're up close to 420. And one of the things that I think is, and this is a disturbing graph, um, if, you, if you worry about carbon in the atmosphere, and we all should. Uh, but what I think is cool is that the, the inset shows how the planet kind of breathes. So the sensors are so sensitive that they can see um, the upswing in a year is when it's northern winter and there's more CO2. And then the downswing when it comes down below the graph is when plants are growing in the northern hemisphere and they're taking up carbon and they peak, you know, the, the, the peak uh, sort of exhale is uh, at the end of winter and the peak inhale um, is at the, you know, late summer, early fall. So where's it coming from? Most of it's coming from electricity and heat production, agriculture, transportation, and other, other sectors. This is from 2015, but I doubt if the percentages have changed that much. Um, which countries is it coming from? Well, China, is the emissions champ now. They passed the US a few years ago. Um, almost half of emissions come out of China, the US and the European Union. Um, and so the, the analogy with the airplane, about 160, 170 countries account for less than 20% of emissions. So all of those of you in coach you just don't have enough. You could eliminate your emissions and it wouldn't help. It would help, but it wouldn't solve the problem. It really comes down to 25 or so countries, but it really comes down to the US and China. 
Um, so how do you compel Kevin and Sarah to do the right thing if you're sitting in the back and you don't have anything but a toothbrush or maybe part of a flight with a business class seat to give up? So that's, that's why it's taking so long to come to a resolution. Um, this is just to show what's been happening over time. So the dotted line, the first one, 1997, well, the negotiation started in 92. Well, 94. 97 was the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so the US was far ahead of uh, China and the EU. Um, and then China passed the US in about 2005 as the biggest annual emitter. Um, the US is still the lead in cumulative emissions over time. But look at what's been happening to GDP. And what worries me about this is if you think about um, China's current per capita GDP and its current population being significantly smaller than the US per capita GDP, the population's bigger, the per capita GDP is smaller in China. So as they start closing that gap, um, what is that gonna do to emissions? globally, if they don't make some significant changes. And what frustrates me is that back in the early 90s, the US was a, played a big enough role that had we taken things seriously, we could affect the whole climate. And now, like everybody in coach, we're dependent on China as well. And it's, it's, it's not a nice feeling when you have to depend on somebody else to do the right thing particularly if you've been doing the wrong thing for a long time. Um, this is just a look at per capita emissions. And again, um, the US per capita emissions are coming down. Um, China's are growing, but they seem to have leveled off. But what's gonna happen as China continues to get wealthier and wealthier? Um, so it's a global problem. The scientific response, uh, I've only put two examples up here, but you hear about the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, which was an effort that was agreed to in 1988 uh, to look at the science and put out an, a, a synthesis of all of this for decision makers it meant to influence the UN and it did influence it to the degree that the UN committed to the framework convention on climate change. Um, coming out of the first George Bush administration, um, the US was quite serious about climate under the first George Bush. Um, we pushed for the IPCC and funded a lot of it. And then we created our own um, national climate assessment and the US Global Change Research Program, which coordinates the efforts of all the federal agencies that work on climate. Um, and then the political response has been the framework convention on climate change. And the goal of that is to quote, stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic or human induced interference with the climate system. And one of the problems with the negotiations that comes back over and over again is that they put in words like dangerous and they don't agree on a definition. So here we are 28 years later and we're way behind on what we finally committed to. And is it dangerous? Well, of course, but is it, does it meet everybody's definition? Probably not. Um, so what happens at the UN, uh, at the UN FCCC? Um, the COP is the conference of the parties, but going on at the same time are multiple meetings. There's the COP, there's the COP serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol, CMP, um, or COP MOP, it's sometimes called. Um, the US is not in the Kyoto Protocol, but they still meet. The meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement, and then there are two subsidiary bodies to the COP, which are where most of the work gets done until the end. And then there's side events. And what students and professors and others like to go for is the side events, because it's a chance to show off your work, see people that are doing similar things or dissimilar things that you want to learn about. Um, and there's kind of a trade show feel to it all. Um, and those are uh, some of the negotiators sitting there. Um, when you turn your little country sign up, that means you want to talk. Um, so again, the negotiators are parties or countries. Um, the UN Framework Convention has a secretariat which organizes all of this stuff and tries to keep everything moving along. Um, and then there are observer groups, which includes the UN bodies, NGOs, 
uh, universities like Columbia, um, more and more private companies going. Um, there are religious groups and Leonardo DiCaprio shows up frequently. I almost physically ran into Al Gore. I did run into Jerry, uh, Jerry Brown from California a few years ago. And yes, there, there's a group of vegans who hands out sandwiches outside the gates. Um, and their thing is that if we were all to become vegan, it would put a huge dent in carbon emissions if we stopped eating meat. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a fun, odd atmosphere. So the major topics are mitigation, which is the, that's the most important thing. How are we gonna stop emitting so much carbon and how are we gonna remove carbon from the atmosphere so the planet stabilizes at a level that will avoid dangerous interference. Um, and then there's adaptation. So dealing with the consequences of what's already happening, what will continue to happen. Um, adaptation has sort of grown in importance. Early on, it was thought that if we focus too much on adaptation, that would be an admission that we probably would fail to mitigate. And so the word adaptation, I believe, only appears once in the original convention. Um, and there is as much or more talk about how to help countries that depend heavily on fossil fuel sales, how would we help them adapt as we mitigate it? And there was less money for fossil fuels. Um, since the mid nineties, there's been a whole lot more climate change and a whole, model, whole lot more attention to adaptation because adaptation is what is so important to those of you in coach, the, the developed world that depends heavily on working outside, agriculture, tourism, forestry, et cetera. So some newer topics that are gaining importance in, uh, over the last few years, um, loss and damage. This is gonna be a real, this will be interesting to see what happens in Sharm El Sheikh. Um, loss and damage is the, the idea, that was almost an example of it. Um, uh, the idea that there are things that we won't be able to adapt to. If you live in a small island, small atoll, uh, and the sea level rises as much as is expected, what are you gonna do about it? Um, there's nowhere to pump the water to if you're in the middle of the ocean. So things will be lost. Places that are uh, just overwhelmed by drought and become um, either unairable or uninhabitable. Um, so should places or countries that are suffering from that be compensated is the real question. Um, and if so, how much? The rich countries are adamantly opposed. The US is usually the most vocal about it, but the EU is perfectly happy to let us keep it from moving forward. Um, finance is the thing that underlies all of it. How are we gonna pay for all of this? How are we gonna try to do this justly? You hear a lot about a just transition. Um, it's gonna, a lot of that is just gonna come down to who's gonna pay for what. And that's been an issue from the very beginning. Um, capacity building is growing in importance because as countries are making these commitments through their nationally determined contributions and their national adaptation plans and so forth, figuring out how to make it all work is gonna be hard. Um, in the US and Europe, the challenge on the mitigation side will largely be political will and the willingness to pay for, to make things happen. Um, in the developing world, it's gonna be very important to, uh, to transfer capacity so that they can um, know how to produce forecasts and use data and so forth. Um, action for climate empowerment is kind of a ancillary piece of capacity building. Um, the idea there is to democratize the effort to deal with climate change and get information out to cities and to subnational groups and empower people to understand what's going on and be involved in the decision-making. Um, more and more action coming from cities, which is where most people live, um, but they're, they aren't represented because it's the conference of the parties, which is countries, not cities. Um, oddly, subnational action got a real boost during the Trump years because the US as a country was not doing a whole lot. Um, and so former Mayor Bloomberg and a network of cities really tried to push and say, hey, uh, look at the cities in the US, we're doing stuff. And we're working with a lot of other cities in other countries. And then the private sector, ultimately, um, governments can set rules and set investments, but the action really comes from private actors, whether it's a smallholder farmer or a massive corporation. 
this is one hour of one day of the agenda at, I think this was in, I can't remember where. Um, let's see. Sorry, I can't remember. I think it was in Bonn, um, which was the Fiji cop. But it's incredibly busy. There's a lot going on every day. It's exhausting. Theoretically, it runs from 10 to 6, but often it goes late into the night. I got lucky when I was a negotiator. Um, the first one I went to was in Kenya, and they were worried about everybody's safety, so they made us leave at 6. Um, the year before, I think it was in Montreal, and I had colleagues who were up until 2, 3 in the morning. They said other people were, you know, they just came with a toothbrush so they could get going the next day. Um, and it's even harder on the developing country delegates because they tend to have to stay further from the venue because they can't afford the super expensive hotels that are near the venue. So where the US and China are in a, within a very short walk of wherever it takes place, if you're Vanuatu or Bangladesh or whatever, you may spend an hour or two of your morning and evening just coming and going to the place where you, you then have an endless day. Um, so how do they manage the complexity of the schedule? They, they form negotiating groups, um, groups with similar attitudes, similar interests. The European Union is obviously one, the umbrella group. I don't know how they came up with that name. That is the US, Japan, I believe Norway, Canada, Australia. And it's gonna be interesting this year because Russia has always been part of the umbrella group. Um, the group of 77 is the, the large group representing developing countries. It's the G77 and China. China is, depending on who you ask, second biggest economy of the world biggest developing country, um, but they are still, they still work with the G77. Um, SIDS are small island developing states, LDCs are the least developed, least developed countries. There are several others, um, but that's just to give you a sense that there's so much going on and developing country delegations will tend to have two or three people in them, maybe four or five. The US will send 40 or 50. China will send 40 or 50, the, the EU will send more. So again, just staffing multiple, multiple, multiple meetings going on simultaneously is a challenge. So they have to form these groups. Um, what does everybody want? It's hard to say. The US would like for things to get solved without it costing us a whole lot. Um, I think that the, the negotiators Many of them have been doing this for a long time. They sincerely care about this. They are bound by the constraints that come from whoever's in office. Um, and they're bound by the constraints that come from whoever's controlling Congress. So we would like to see things resolved without wrecking our economy and without receiving a massive bill for the damages that will occur, particularly in developing countries. The EU kind of wants the same thing. They're a little bit softer. They kind of want to be seen as the the good guys when they're, you know, they kind of can intercede between the US and the developing countries. Um, China wants things to happen, but they want to, my view is they want to be treated as a developing country so they have less responsibility, um, which is a little bit awkward because that's where the emissions are mostly coming from now. Um, small islands want to survive. They want to be compensated for what they're losing. They want help uh, adapting and they want the big guys, the big players, to get their shit together and cut their emissions so they don't have to worry about sinking. Um, and that's, that's what's terrible about the Africa group, the least developed countries, et cetera. For this to work out, really two countries have to take action or two plus the EU. Um, when you get below that, the next, I think India is the fourth biggest emitter and they're 4% of the total. Um, so, and they're not, they're not really doing much right now to curb their emissions because they're only at 4% and they see themselves as a developing country. But it really, you know, India could go all solar and it. it's not gonna put a dent in it. It's, it's the US, China, and the EU that really need to make change. And the bottom, well, others, that's not really a place. Um, but small islands, Africa, the least developed countries just have to count on us and they have very limited leverage to get us to do th the right thing. So just some quick background on some of the past COPs. When the convention came into effect, everybody thought it would be pretty quick. Um, that's partly why they didn't talk a lot about adaptation because they thought, oh, we'll just 
will mimic the um, uh, acid, the, the acid depleting, the acid rain, the approach to dealing with acid rain in the US will we'll turn, we'll create a market. It's gonna work great. The US played a major role in designing Kyoto, which was a market-based approach. Um, that was 1997, that was the third COP. Uh, and then the US didn't join. Um, 192 did, but only 36 fully participated um, and met their commitments in the first period. And I think some of those didn't actually have commitments because they were developing countries. And under Kyoto, only the, what were called, I think Annex One countries had to take a commitment. And that was basically the OECD countries, the rich countries. So what's Bird Hegel? So in <laughs> negotiating, there's this conflict as there often is in the US government. Um, the president gets to negotiate treaties, the Senate gets to approve the treaty. And then right before Kyoto, there was this Bird Hegel resolution. Um, what was Bird's first name uh, from West Virginia? Robert Bird, thank you. And Chuck Hagel. Chuck Hagel became a pretty strong climate advocate or advocate for doing something about the climate. But in 1997, he was not on board. And so they passed a law that said the US could, or they, they passed a resolution that said that the US could not sign on to a treaty that would undermine the economy um, unless basically China and India had the same commitments. And China and India didn't have to because they were non annex one countries. So, you know, the US designed this thing and then could never join, um, which was frustrating, particularly for my friends who helped negotiate it and then saw it fall apart. So then we came back a few years later at COP15 with the Copenhagen Accord and that didn't work out either. Um, this is where consensus was the, the bugaboo or whatever. Um, there were four or five countries that understandably didn't like that the Copenhagen Agreement got worked out by a small number of countries. I think it was the US, China, a few European countries. And I think it was like Algeria, maybe Nicaragua and a few other countries just said, no, we're not gonna sign on to this thing that you guys designed. Um, you should have included us, but they were running out of time. Um, so that did lead to a significant change in approach on the run up to Paris. Um, and Paris was six years later. And that was when a lot of stuff happened. There was the Paris Agreement, there was the Sendai Framework on uh, disaster risk reduction, and there was the Sustainable Development Goals all happened in the same year. Um, Obama gave this nice quote. I used to put that up just because I like to have his picture during the Trump years, but um, it's a good quote. Um, and it says that, you know, the point of these two is that we don't want to just extract carbon if it doesn't help people's lives get better. It's, it's very important that this has to be seen as a, a way of reducing poverty, which has been on the development agenda for 60 years or more. Um, so we've got to find out a way to link the SDGs and the, and the climate commitments. And actually, well, they didn't say this, but I'll say, we actually have to do something on both of them. <laughs> Writing it down doesn't help if you don't actually follow through. So what was in Paris? Um, it was the first time that they put a, an actual temperature commitment or an, a goal. Um, they committed to well below two and aim for 1.5 degrees. I guess well below is somewhere between 1.5 and two. Um, although I think the world would accept one. I did not enjoy this last summer when it was what, we're at 1.1, 1.2. So I'd be happy to go further beyond. Um, one of the ways it's supposed to work is, so the US could not have binding commitments. The US could not have a treaty, but the convention needs the US. Um, so, it's these voluntary contributions called nationally determined contributions. Um, the US and others work like dogs in the run up to Paris to get people to start making their commitments before so that it would sort of be in the bag. Um, and you could say, look at how, look, we're almost there anyway. Let's, let's, let's sign off on it. Um, and the idea in Paris is to kind of stair step down. They didn't want to make this dramatic, you know, we're going to go from, we're on a path to three and a half degrees. We're going to get to one and a half degrees. And it means we're gonna all sit around in the dark and we're not gonna walk everywhere. They didn't wanna make it too hard. So the idea is that every five years we made our initial commitments and then every five years 
will recommit. It's not explicitly written. And again, this is why definitions are important. Um, the intention is that you'll commit to fewer emissions, but some countries in the, in the re-up last year actually increased their emissions or decreased their ambition. Um, but the idea was that if it's transparent, if people are monitoring what's going on, we'll see positive competition between different groups and we won't have to have binding commitments that the US would never be able to sign on to. We will we'll just through competition, we'll get better and better um, and shame would, would work. Um, there were commitments on helping the developing countries pay for all of this transition. Um, and then adaptation finally got elevated up to be sort of co-equal with mitigation. And there were commitments on funding for that as well. So again, the two, the two main things that came out were the nationally determined contributions. We're gonna to get to net zero by pick a date. Um, national adaptation plans, some of which are incorporated into the NDCs. And then these periodic stock takes where we look and see how things are going. First one was a little bit embarrassing because um, we're behind. Um, and the, there was a commitment in Copenhagen to get to a hundred billion dollars in funding for developing countries per year. And they didn't define where that had to come from. It said from all sources. So the US thought, awesome. We invest more than that privately in renewable energy in the developing world every year. So cross that one off and everybody else thought it meant public funding. And public funding got to about 79 billion in 2019, I think. And so last year they had to say, sorry, we didn't get there, but there's no consequences. So it's, it's kind of a bummer. Um, and it's such a bad precedent. What's that? Well, there's, well, there's plenty of consequences. There's no consequences for the people who didn't write enough checks. Um, so here's where we are, or here's, uh, well, here's the end of the black line is where we are. Um, and this is the arrow shows where different pathways to get to by 2030. Um, and so we're currently somewhere up in that blue zone with what's been committed. Again, we're supposed to ratchet down every five years, um, but we're missing, we, we're not actually implementing what we've said already. So it may be more depressing than this. This was from a year ago. Um, and then the, the, the 1.5, we just take doing an awful lot right off the bat and we haven't done it. Um, so what happened last year in Glasgow? Well, there were new NDCs, um, new, new emission reduction targets. We're on a path towards two and a half degrees. So we're not, we're certainly not significantly below two and we're certainly not to 1.5, but we're getting lower. Um, that $100 billion finance pledge, uh, $79 billion and deep regret. Um, and then the loss and damage funding. This is really, this, is, this could hold things up in, I don't know what they're gonna do, but there has been talk in some developing countries to say, look, if you guys don't agree to a serious agenda item on this, where we get to talk about a funding mechanism for loss and damage, we will not approve the agenda on day one. And everybody, there has to be consensus on all decisions, including whether they agree on the agenda to follow for the next two weeks. And I was at a meeting one of the subsidiary body meetings, and it took about four days to agree to the agenda. Um, so it can, that is one of the things that, that you guys in coach have as long as anybody cares. And I think even the US and China will care this year, but it is, it is kind of discomforting to, to think that all I have to do is my, you know, my main leverage point is to say, I'm not gonna to talk to you about this this year. Um, so they keep talking about the rules for implementing Paris are getting closer. And then there were some big commitments last year on uh, cutting methane emissions. Um, methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas and has a shorter livelihood, uh, sorry, lifetime in the atmosphere. So if you could really cut back on methane emissions, you might start to see uh, climatological benefits within a couple of decades. 
Um, and then there was a goal to eliminate deforestation from agricultural supply chains by 2030. And I don't think we're getting anywhere near that. I hope that you're not feeling too depressed yet. Um, so what we could, what the US committed, and I'm sorry, I'm an American, so I, and I've worked for the American government on this stuff, so I bring in a, a US perspective to it. Um, and during the Q&A, anybody who has other perspectives should please introduce them. Um, so we committed to cut our emissions by about half by 2030. Um, we're doing okay, but that's heavily dependent on, it was first dependent on Build Back Better, uh, which didn't pass. And now it's dependent on the Inflation Reduction Act, which did pass. And so now it's the challenge of implementing that and making sure that a new Congress after the election next week doesn't somehow revoke it or roll it back or stall it or something like that. Um, we committed to putting a, about 10% of the total commitment um, into international climate finance and doubling the USAID climate assistance budget. I assume that means from the 2019 or 2020 levels, which were under Trump. And so they weren't that great because he cut it a lot. Aid overall, AIDS development spending hit a, a new high under Trump. They sent $24 billion out the door, um, but it wasn't for climate. And then within the aid climate budget, they want to triple the adaptation budget. So I, I unfortunately, I don't know what the, the, the real numbers are there. Um, so what next? Well, everybody wants to know whether we're going to be able to implement what we say we're going to implement. Because when the US is failing to do what we've said, it undermines the motivation of everybody else. Because we're still seen as the country that ought to be able to get this right and get stuff done and introduce the new technologies. And we've got the money for it if we would just spend it and share the technology and all of that stuff. Um, and so it just sort of takes the wind out of Europe's sales and Japan's and everybody else's. Um, which affects other countries' ability to implement and willingness. Um, there's gonna be ongoing questions of who's gonna pay, how are we gonna pay, what's the mechanism we're gonna use? Um, is it public or private and how do we find a mix? And what happens if we don't do it? What happens if we don't even agree on agenda? Um, well, again, last summer was kind of unpleasant and so we're gonna get more and more of those. So here's a few pictures. This was Paris, that's my daughter and me under a sign. She thought it was really cool that I was going to a meeting that had posters all over Paris for it. And when there's a cop in a city, it tends to take over. So those are ice, icebergs and, uh, that somebody set up in a square in Paris um, so that you could watch them melt because it was, it was right after Thanksgiving. So it was kind of warm. Um, that's the moment after the Paris Agreement got signed. Uh, my colleague Melody got in. She is friends with um, with one of the uh, Christina. Um, I can't remember her last name, but anyway, her daughter got her a ticket. Um, so under Obama and again under Biden, the U.S. always has a, the countries. Different countries have these pavilions where they can give talks and show things off, um, and that's a, an event that we did in Paris. That's uh, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack, the head of the World Food Program, and then two, two researchers who organized the event. Um, and then we didn't have them under Trump, but again, cities, the, the, um, the We Are Still In network organized its own pavilion to say, look, even though the, the federal government in the US is not taking action at the subnational level we are, and that's Al Gore uh, giving a talk there. Um, we had an astronaut call in from the space station in Madrid two years, three years ago. Um, and then the year before that, it was in Katowice, Poland, which was a coal mining town. And so somebody from an NGO uh, dressed up in a coal sullied Santa suit. Um, there used to be a polar bear that I think was with Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Fund that you just see, it was like this old, um, it looked like a really underfed polar bear. It was a guy in a person in a polar bear suit um, and it was filthy. And they, you just see them lying outside a room somewhere and they'd move around from time to time. So what's next? So it does, these negotiations do have an influence on US behavior um, between Rio and little, yeah, around Kyoto. Uh, 
all the countries committed to catalog their emissions. And a lot of countries said, we want to do this. We don't know how. So the US put together a program called Country Studies. And I still have people come up to me and say, that was the best thing that anybody did for the developing world having to do with climate. Because a lot of people that you'll see on stage now went through country, country studies and got their start on climate there, um, including a guy that uh, that we do a lot of work with named Salim Huck. And he got his start in climate adaptation through country studies. It was a really cool program that was put on by the EPA and the Department of Energy. Um, after Copenhagen, after that little train wreck, um, we had to regroup. And so it helped USAID focus on where we were gonna work. And we picked small island states, Africa, least developed countries, and then glacier dependent countries, uh, Peru, Nepal, and a few others. Um, but it also, focused on what we did because we, we were providing the support in the developing world to get countries ready to sign on to Paris so that they could develop their NDC. Um, so they could think about a LEDs as a low emission development strategy. Uh, an INDC is an intended nationally determined contribution, which was the first thing that you submitted in the run up to Paris. Um, we did more work on adaptation. Uh, we started something first called the Adaptation Partnership and then, then the National Adaptation Planning Global Network to help bring countries together and help, help them share lessons. Um, and then I already had the, the post-Paris stuff and aid is fine, USAID is finally starting to get its new programs out um, to support developing countries with climate. And the, the, the linkage between state and aid is kind of interesting with aid really trying to do its part to help developing countries feel like they're getting some assistance from the US. Um, so the, the things that kind of have to come together are uh, more resources for adaptation, um, more, you know, stronger commitments and, and an indication that not only are we making strong commitments, but we're going to follow through and uh, deliver them, um, hold, figure out how to hold countries accountable. So there's more than expressing deep regret, um, doing something effective on loss and damage, and then figuring out the right amount of money, but also the right channels to get it out to people that need it. And then I think it's going to be very important that we focus on capacity building so the money gets spent on things that will be effective. And right now, from people I know that work at the uh, Global Environment Facility and the Green Climate Fund, there's a there the, the financing commitments have not been met. But there is also a dearth of good projects. So there's money sitting there that is not finding a, a place to get spent effectively. Um, and then with all of this, the thing is we've, we've made the commitments, it's time to implement, it's time to take action. Um, so hopefully this COP, which is in Egypt, it's the Africa COP, uh, the developing country COP, um, hopefully this is going to put pressure on the delegates to, to push for more action. And then the most important thing is not what happens there, it's what happens when everybody comes home. Um, and if everybody comes home happy that they made commitments or whatever, but we don't follow through with action, nothing's going to change. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. That was great. I know I saw a few questions being written down in the audience. If you just want to raise your hand, we definitely have time. Walk over here. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, um, there has been a lot of talk about um, having Egypt being the host country in light of the various like human rights abuses that have taken place. I wanted to ask you, as someone who has been to many of these and has been very plugged in, to what extent do you think that the um, choice of Egypt as a host country is going to undermine like progress being made at the COP or is going to undermine like public perception of what goes on there? Good question. Um, I don't have a, I probably don't have a good answer, but I'll, I'll pontificate for a moment. Um, so every year the COP moves from continent to continent. Um, so it's Africa's year and it's tough to find, there's going to be 40,000 people at this thing. So it's tough to find a country in some continents that is politically stable, even if it's through kind of strong arming, 
um, and has the hotel space and the conference rooms to and an airport nearby to accommodate all of that. So, yeah, I heard today that uh, some youth groups are being kept out. That uh, somebody told me that they were checking people's social um, social network stuff, WhatsApp and Twitter and so forth when they arrive. Um, so yeah, it's kind of oppressive. It's also, I think it's terrible that the prices are outrageous. Um, the hotel rooms are crazy expensive. And this is, I think, being partly driven not by the market, but by government pressure to raise the price. Um, and maybe that was just a rumor, but I heard that the government was going to set a floor of $700 a night, um, which hurts the African countries far more than it's going to hurt again, the US or the Chinese or the EU, which means that those delegates will stay farther away in cheaper places and spend a lot of their time not sleeping or negotiating, but schlepping back and forth. Um, yeah, and you know, what, in 2019, I think, it was gonna be in Chile, um, and then they had civil unrest, and so they had to quickly move it to Madrid. Um, they had it in, it was the Fiji COP, in 2017, but it was held in bond because Fiji didn't have enough hotels to accommodate 30 to 40,000 people. So it's it's gotten so big that it's gotten tough to find a place that can host, um, that hits all the criteria that you would want. It was hard in, uh, in, in Poland, in Katowice, people were upset because it was a coal mining town, but it was also, it's not a big place. So, it was hard to find, people were coming in from several hours away. People, last year in Glasgow, people were staying in Edinburgh and taking the train in for an hour every morning. It's hard to find a place that could accommodate 40,000 extra people. Um, and the US does not, I don't think the US wants it because of just the chaos that could ensue with protesters and stuff. Yeah, thank you so much for your um, presentation. It's a great one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, you mentioned capacity building several times. I'm just wondering if you could share your thoughts on how to create more effective capacity building to developing countries and um, how, how do we empower um, people in the developing countries to connect and to act? From capacity empower them to do what? And to, to how do we empower people in different countries, developing countries, to um, to act and lead in the climate change efforts? Well, that's an easy question. Thank you. Um, so, so well, I turned off the slides, but um, so there's a couple of things. The I think it's important for people to, I think people are beginning to understand, and I think it's important for the developing countries to push that capacity building has to be part of the support that they get. And it was, there was a, a guy, a negotiator named Fred from Malawi. Um, and he and I would always argue because he would say, we just need money. And I would say, I think you need help too. I think you need training. Um, and then he stopped me in the hall in Paris toward the end and said, John, you know what? I think you were right. I think we're gonna get what we wanted and I think we're gonna need help. So I think that there, I think just like it took 25 years for, or whatever, 21 years for adaptation to be treated equally with uh, mitigation. I think people in developing countries and in the, in the donor countries need to start viewing that as a critical piece along with the money and the tech transfer and the political reform. Because your question about how can people get involved? Well, if you're in a country that doesn't want to hear about the climate because it's inconvenient and they suppress protest or action, then that's stuck. So it's, it's this incredibly sticky, difficult problem that draws on politics and economics and science and agronomy and so forth. And it, it wraps up everything that has been, we've been trying to do in international development, which I guess started with the Marshall Plan um, after World War II, 
and it's kind of a it's kind of a microcosm because climate touches on all of the things that international development does. And when I was at Aid, we had a person working on practically every topic that the agency had a bureau working on, and it's incredibly challenging. And so I think I think one of the more effective things is developing countries need to let it be known that they want capacity building, and they need to let the agencies like USAID and the World Bank and what used to be DFID, uh, FCDO, um, and the Germans, GIZ and the French, let those country offices know, this is what we need. If you, you know, you're here to help, but we wanna have a voice in how you help us. And then, so there's a, there's a Paris Committee on Capacity Buildings trying to promote capacity building. Um, and then there's a, that action for climate empowerment thing. The idea there is to empower people to have access to information and tools for taking action at the subnational level. Hi, um, thank you so much for sharing your insights and expertise. Um, so I was I was at COP26 last year in Glasgow, um, and I was really involved in like the youth efforts, um, huh? and I was invited by some religious groups. Uh, but why I was there primarily as a representative of my uh, organization at the time, who focused on intergenerational dialogue and conversation in business decision making spaces and sort of platforming youth from around the world. And I guess my question for you that I, I have a lot when I'm taking classes here and, and just like seeing the news is like, what can we do um, to make an impact? And I know that's sort of like a hard question, but maybe an easy question as well. But, you know, I, most people will say, oh, get involved with your local politics. Um, but I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, what do you think we can do to make an impact on, you know, the discussions that happen behind closed doors that we don't necessarily have access to? I would say that's not an easy question, <laughs> but thanks for offering that as an option. Um, I think doing, well, I think it's important for people to go to COP. I think it's more important for people to do stuff when they're not at COP. Um, so I don't know what you kept doing after Glasgow. Are you now at, at CEPA or at Columbia? Okay. Okay. So I think Ultimately for in the US, for us to make progress, the public is gonna have to want us to make progress. The public is gonna have to see that we can enjoy the things we enjoy without suffering. So there's a guy named, uh, well, I just, Amory Levins, who uh, founded the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, and like in the seventies, he said, what do people want? They want cold beer and hot showers and they don't care how they get cold beer and hot showers. So whether we generate the electricity, they don't know what's going on behind the plug, behind the outlet. So if we generate it cleanly or we generate it dirty, as long as they get cold beer and hot showers, they're gonna go with it. So that's the trick. It's figuring out how to make these dramatic changes as unnoticeable or as beneficial as possible. Um, so work on that, solve that one. <laughs> I think we've got a couple more, John, if that's okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you for speaking to us. So you mentioned that there's about 40 US negotiators at every COP, including yourself. So I'm wondering if you could give us an example of a particular role that you had in a negotiation during a particular COP to kind of help us visualize what it's like to be a negotiator in these situations. Sure. So just to be clear, I'm no longer with the government. I left in 2017. Um, so early on, so there's that list of, you know, there's those television screens that show what's going on and you get a program every morning and the US wants to have a person in every room. The big, all the big delegations want to try to have a person in every room. So I covered adaptation. So, and I was not the lead, but I would, there was somebody from either the State Department or NOAA who was the lead negotiator for the US on the topic. We would read up on it. There would be new texts that had to be discussed and debated um, and revised before the end of the two weeks. So I would just help whoever the lead was. Um, and the reason that USAID would participate would, you know, the State Department 
would say, okay, somebody has suggested that everybody write a new report every year. How is that going to affect developing countries? And I would say, well, it's going to be hard. There, you know, the people in these governments, there's not that many staff. So they've already got a full-time job. And now you're going to ask them to write a report every year on something that it's probably not going to change much from year to year unless we give them the money to change it. So why don't we let them do it every three years? And so things like that. Just I, my job was to kind of figure out how it would affect uh, the way the ability of a country of a developing country to do what was being asked, or how would it affect the U.S. So early on, like in Copenhagen, before Copenhagen, the U.S. was worried that if we introduced insurance, that we would get a massive bill for everything that ever went wrong. And so they were going to, you know, the negotiator was going to try to kill the insurance language about insurance and the adaptation thing. And I said, well, no, insurance is actually quite useful. It's, there's an important signal in the price of a, of a premium. You know, it tells you how much the risk is. If it's not subsidized, it's a nice way to, you know, we can work through what's traditionally seen as adaptation on transfer on managing the physical risk, but there's always going to be some leftover financial risk. So that's where insurance can come in. And they said, oh, okay. And so, so it's just sort of helping them keep on top of everything. And it's a lot of time standing around outside of a room, waiting to get in, reading what I find to be usually kind of boring text um, and just helping out. And then if you're from a developing country, it's same stuff, but maybe getting pulled in multiple directions. And then, oh my God, for uh, if, if you don't speak English, um, that just makes it even, I mean, the, you know, there's, there's talk about having justice courses at the climate school and just looking at the cop and all of the little things that undermine the the position of the developing countries the talks are all in english and you can get a, a translation in your ear but it's not the same because you have somebody who's talking in a monotone in a booth and maybe getting the language wrong um, versus hearing what's really being said you're staying a long way away um, there's only there's maybe only two or three of you from your country just the, the number of disadvantages just stack up. And then you're from a poor country and you're dependent on the US, the EU and China to do the right thing. So anyway, that was a digression, but I hope you got some kind of a sense. I'm getting the signal that we may be able to eat soon, but I'm happy to take a few more questions. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, thank you. It was a really great talk. Um, but I just wanted to ask a little bit more about Colombia's role in these types of things. And I know you talked about observers generally and mentioned like one agenda item, but I was wondering what the Colombia delegate kind of how it fills its time for two weeks and also um, what sort of effect do you think having observers like Colombia there um, actually has? So so there's the negotiations that usually go on toward the back of the venue. And then there's all these side events where people are giving talks, um, you know, kind of like the colloquium that's out at Lamont every Friday, only less scientific. Um, so I'm doing three or four of those. Um, I'm on a panel with the World Meteorological Organization. I'm doing something with the UK Med Agency, UK Med Office. Um, I'm organizing a little meeting with the Gates Foundation and some other folks to talk about public and private sector models, models for sort of dividing up responsibility for delivering climate services through private sector companies or public sector organizations. Um, Alex Halliday is doing a bunch of events and, and meetings and stuff. And, everybody who works on this topic tries to get there. And so it's a great place to see everybody that you might want to work with, people you might want to collaborate with, people you might hope to fund you, um, and so on. So it's kind of a, it's like a trade fair and a job fair and a whatever else. I don't know, Charlotte, does that kind of capture it? 
Yeah, I think last year and this, it's important just to let people know that there's a climate school and that you can come here and learn all this stuff. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks so much, John, again, that was amazing. And the fantastic questions that came from the audience. Um, Thanks for coming out. We have so much food, enough food to feed everyone at COP <laughs> um, and also drinks. So please stay and chat and hang out. And um, again, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, John.